Hello everyone and welcome back to Solar System Tourism in Kerbal Space Program 1.8.1 with Realism Overhaul. We begin with a resupply mission to the International Space Station, a very typical thing that we have to do in this save. And so I'm moving off an expended supply vessel, if you will. It's just a really big container with a tiny bit of RCS and we're going to replace it with a new one being launched here on a Raptor 9 rocket, also what I call a Unix rocket. And it is simply nine Raptor engines on the bottom, one Raptor engine on the second stage, a Raptor vacuum, of course, on the second stage. So basically analogous to SpaceX's own Falcon 9, and we do have grid fins on the first stage for its return. Also fins at the bottom because that's actually what it uses as the landing legs. So that has been tested out. I'm not the best at recovering it, but it's possible. So there we reserved some fuel for its return. And here's the second stage going and the payload fairing separation. And you can see it's just another one of those supply modules. Uh, no need to make this too complicated. Uh, we want to get over with the simple supply missions around Earth and the Moon so that we can get to the interplanetary stuff. So here, the second stage does a lot of the rendezvous, all of the rendezvous, I think. And we just need to use the little fuel in the supply container to dock. So we don't actually dock the second stage to it. That would be going too far. In fact, it was already going quite far as it is. So here it is lining up and docking. We have the KW rocketry batteries on the side of it. But unfortunately, we ran out of electric charge on the second stage. It was supposed to deorbit itself, but we ran out of electric charge. So I sent out one of the tugs from the station, this is one of the Canada tugs, uh, to grab on to the second stage. Not to actually tug it down, that would be too much for the little tug, but to give it the electric charge it needs to do the deorbit burn. So here we are clawing the second stage. And there we go. Doesn't matter that it's off-center because we're still controlling from the second stage's own probe core. We just needed to give it power. And we will continue to give it power. I didn't want to transfer the power in. That could have been done, but... We just do the deorbit burn like that. And then the little tug goes back to the station. It has enough delta V so that it can bring itself back like that. That is not a problem. After all, it's supposed to tug fairly large station modules into place. So here we are. I just wanted to add a few shots of the station as we approach. And we just grab onto a little container. Uh, probably not the best to grab onto the solar panels like that in order to insulation foil. But anyway, it is on. And we check on other life support situations. As we are here with Dialer Root and Mr. Doobie, we always have to check in on them because they have a water recycler that needs updating. Dialer Root and Mr. Doobie are on their way to Saturn. This, however, is a bonus supply vessel we had previously captured into orbit around Mars, and now we need to make sure it gets to something that can use the supplies. And so we're doing some minor burns. It doesn't have much Delta V to work with, so I get it to where it can go. And that is a vessel with Blitzfurry on board. And so here it is docking with said vessel. Uh, that vessel has Mars Base Camp modules from Lonesome Robots. I really like those. And we'll actually get to see the interior of the crew compartment there. I forget if I was the one who was curious about it or somebody else mentioned it. But there we have docked the supply vessel. So. We'll see what happens with all this later on, but this is the interior of the Mars Gate Base Camp Science Lab, I think it is. And you can see it's got nice windows that we can look out at Mars with, and also with raster prop monitor, it has those things at the top, possibly some of the ASET prop things. And so it's a very nice interior. And looked at it before. But I should check some of the other Mars Base Camp and Lonesome Robots parts to see if they have interesting interiors as well. But anyway, that's all there around Mars. And here we are with Envy Silence returning from Venus and entering Earth SOI. Now, we see no Delta V here. It does have some uh, RCS, but the liquid hydrogen either boiled off or we just ran out of it. So we needed some sort of rescue mission. I think it probably boiled off. We probably had some, at least. Uh, which is weird because 
It didn't boil off on the way to Venus or at Venus, but only on the way back just to mess with us. So anyway, we are sending up a little tug for it and launching that on SLS here. SLS was the easiest thing to grab and mobilize quickly in this case. If only that was the case in real life. Uh, but here it goes. Yeah, in the context of the game, it is rather convenient. But off go the boosters. Uh, perhaps a little bit early. They're supposed to separate at 2 minutes and 6 seconds. You can see that they move forward a bit because I released them 2 seconds early and they still had just a little bit of thrust. So, yes, remember your boosters should separate for SLS at 2 minutes and 6 seconds. For the space shuttle, it's 2 minutes and 3 seconds. So I basically separated them at space shuttle time instead of 5 segment booster time, which is 2 minutes and 6 seconds. Okay, we got the upper stage lit properly, finally. And payload fairing separation. Okay, so all set and we make our rendezvous. I was trying to rendezvous with it prior to periapsis because of course we want to do the capture burn at periapsis. That would be the most efficient thing. But we did not actually manage to make the rendezvous so quickly. So it took a lot of work to do this rendezvous. These are the initial burns. We haven't uh, gotten close to the rendezvous point, but here we are at the rendezvous point and you can see the difference between us and the target is more than 3,000 meters per second. And yeah, that's a lot. Now we do have it. Actually, this has locked fuel. I locked the fuel that would be necessary to actually push the target into orbit. At least how much I thought would be necessary. But we are not doing this burn accurately at all because of the sheer amount of time it takes. Because of the long burn time and the fact that we're somewhat radial, I had to use more Delta V than I originally wanted and therefore we have to unlock the fuel that I had locked to push the target. We did eventually get to the target, of course, but you can see our altitude going up there. And by the time we actually grab on to MV Silence's vehicle, we are very high up indeed, and so this is not going to be very efficient. Of course, again, it would be best to do the capture burn at periapsis, and we're nowhere near there. So here's the docking, and I try anyway. I could have argued that, darn it, that liquid hydrogen should not have boiled off and I should have been able to put some in. These are supposed to be basically zero boil off tanks, however you want to imagine that, but they have to be based on the NASA plan for the NTR system, because otherwise they won't have enough propellant to uh, come back from Mars, which is what it was for. So you could control boil off by a number of ways, including just cooling down the gaseous hydrogen. That is an option, just use power to refrigerate it. That is a way of doing it, but yep, yeah, one way or another it has to be done. Anyway, the tug did the best it could and we still had some more to do and I did the rest with the RCS and it turned out we had enough, amazingly enough. The RCS in these tanks is per the NASA specs for these tanks for the NTR system. That's nuclear thermal propulsion system. And so we do capture. It is a lot of RCS propellant and that is because they intended in the plan to do a lot of the burns with that propellant. Okay, so here we are. We have to lift up our periapsis, which is currently negative. So we go out to the apoapsis and handle that and now we are in a stable orbit. So Envisons did get back into Earth orbit safely, uh, though it took some extra work. Next up we have a Uranus return mission that actually will get to Uranus way before Mikko Gagozov, who is our tourist heading out to Uranus, so uh, Mikko will have a return vessel waiting and there is its approach. So. Anyway, it's not arriving yet, but it's well on its way. Here we have another supply vessel, and I decided to launch it not on Daenerys, which is the large Aerospike SSTO. This is a smaller Aerospike SSTO that has 36 J2 engines at the bottom, of course sea level optimized. And so, yeah, 
This is not quite the large Daenerys Aerospike SSTO, which has 36 M1 engines with more than three times the thrust. But this still has plenty of get up and go. I, I say more than three times, probably more like more than six times the thrust of the J2 engines. So there it is. Still, Aerospike SSTOs, one of my favorite things. And there go the fairings. That's not so much my favorite thing, but at least it didn't collide into anything. So there's a nice big container of supplies, and it's headed to Skylab. Skylab 2. And I just didn't want to have to resupply Skylab too frequently, so... This huge container, more than 100 tons of supplies, will ensure that we don't have to revisit Skylab with a additional load of supplies. And I did try to bring back the J2 SSTO because I was curious as to whether its re-entry characteristics would be different than the M1 version because it's got a different relationship between mass and surface area. So... But it turns out that it wasn't too bad. In fact, it, uh, the M1 one has to have additional flaps go out to make sure it can keep cool. This one did not seem to need that at all. So... It's all right as it is. The problem is we have no way of slowing down to land or splash down or anything like that. Uh, trying to light the main engines did not work out for us. And we're not supposed to use those for landing anyway. So yeah. Anyway, the supply vessel proceeds on to Skylab. And this process took a whole lot of burns actually because we were using small engines that didn't do anything right on the maneuver nodes. You can see them and their awesome might there. I <laughs> uh, sort of underpowered this. But you know, if you can manage it, you don't want to be carrying large engines if you can instead be carrying more supplies. So here we are approaching and slowing down. Yep. And we need to move off the spent containers to make way for this. And so that one is floating off and we will deorbit it. And the new one is taking its place. Since this module is bound to be attached to the station for quite a long time, I saw fit to put another docking port on the opposite side of it so something else could dock to it. And we are docking to a common berthing mechanism port, but the other one is a NASA docking port. So that's all docked, and I think we remove the one on the opposite side since it's also spent, and use this one to grab the other one. So we dock these two together, and deorbit them together. And there we go. Okay, all attached. And the deorbit burn. And with that done, we focused on another station that needed supplies. This was apparently the resupply time. And this is the Almaz station around the moon, but in this case, I wanted to just get rid of the Almaz station. We put our two Kerbals who were on board the station into the Gaganyan spacecraft, heavily modified, of course, for lunar purposes. And they would be returning back to Earth. And then I decided to just deorbit this Almaz station. Since we already have two space stations around the moon, we have Mir and we have Lunar Gateway, we really didn't need this. This was sort of a tech demo, but it's not the most useful station. Now, it is imbalanced with that one extra supply module off to one side, so I decided the best way to deal with that was to spin stabilize it, which is what we're doing here. And yes, it is faithfully spinning and deorbiting with a very long deorbit burn because we've only got little tiny engines on it. But there we go, and here we are crashing into the surface. Yes, we get the space station disposal explosion here. This was an uh, extra special one as it turns out. As we clip into the ground, have the game delay, and not only do we get that initial explosion, but then we get this weird thing where other bits of the station, one piece at a time, decide to explode. Presumably hopping, but it's not entirely clear what is going on. 
To some extent, they seem to be going lower into the surface. Anyway, that's all done. So now we return with our two crew members here. That's Raider Nick and Josen. And it's complicated because the station had been in a polar orbit around the moon. And so we not only had to do the initial escape burn, but also a correction burn out in Earth orbit. But we do that, the service module did its job, and we are coming back in through the atmosphere. You'll notice that I actually used a claw to get onto the station because I couldn't figure out which docking ports would work with the docking ports on the Yamada station. Anyway, they survived that. And here we have aero cap separation. Very vigorous. And the parachutes brought them down at about 5 meters per second. It was on ground. And recover vessel. Next up, I used the ion engines on the Mars return vessel to bring it into an orbit that could rendezvous with some Kerbals who could be brought back home from Mars or Mars orbit. But that took a long time, like more than an hour. So that ended up being what I concluded the stream with. And so here, with this continuing these burns, I'll say thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.